four, and our subject is going on to perfection. Going on to perfection. Ephesians chapter number four. And of course, uh, in going on to perfection, we're talking about spiritual growth. Going on to uh, full spiritual maturity. And of course, spiritual maturity is measured by uh, one's obedience to the word of God and their subduing the natural tendencies of the flesh, bringing them uh, under control of God's will and of God's power. And um, of course, um, we uh, want to emphasize this, that you cannot perfect yourself. God has a process that he has established for our perfection. And again, uh, I'm going to give you a little definition of uh, perfection. It has to do with subduing the members of your body, the members of our body, subduing the members of our body to obey God's word and to do his will. Subduing the members of our body to obey God's word and to do his will. Uh, the ability to do that takes spiritual maturity. It's just like this. Um, the most helpless creature out of all God's creation is the human baby. When a baby comes into the world, the baby cannot care for itself. Now you have other animals, for example, a horse or a colt. Once a colt is born, uh, they're up on their feet within a matter of minutes walking around. But when it comes to newborn baby, uh, they can't do anything. Uh, they have to be cared for. They have to be taken care of. Uh, and of course, until they get to the maturity uh, within themselves to where they can hold their own head up or they can hold their, hold their own bottle and then eventually get to the point to where uh, they can get up and scoot and then eventually crawl and then eventually walk. Now, as they're trying to learn to walk, they get a little wobbly and they fall down, um, but they don't stay down, they get back up. Is that right? And then once they learn to walk, then um, we have to watch after them because they tend to get into any and everything they can get into. Uh, but just as it is in the natural, that's how it is in Christ. Um, we grow, we mature, and get to a level to where we're able to do certain things that we could not do um, when we were first saved. And so full spiritual growth and maturity is going on to perfection. Now, there is uh, no saint that is constantly sinning going on to perfection. They're going backwards. They're not going forwards. They're going the opposite direction. And backsliding is going backwards. And so, but God didn't save us to go backwards. He saved us to go forward, onward, and upward. Is that right? And so this is what we want to talk about tonight, going on to perfection. We should be better saints than we were last year um, if we're growing as we ought to grow. Uh, but we want to establish, first of all, that God has put some things in place for our perfection, put some things in place uh, for our salvation. And so for the next hour, this is what we're going to talk about. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. And we're going to deal with verse 11. Uh, let me see. 11 through 16. All right. And let's read. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, as we go back to verse number 11, and as we are breaking in the middle of the thought because we don't have time to deal with uh, the entire chapter, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And when Jesus rose from the dead, um, he gave some gifts to the church. And these gifts are spoken of in verse 11 and verse 12 and the following verses let you know why he gave these gifts. Now he gave five gifts for the perfecting of the saints. The first one, and he gave some apostles. Now notice the word some. Not everybody is an apostle, is that right? He gave some apostles. Now if you look in the dictionary, the word apostle means a follower of Christ. But that is a very generic term. The term Christian means the same thing. And of course you know that every Christian is not an apostle. Can we say amen? But in your Bible, an apostle's job was twofold, and that was to lay the foundation of the New Testament church by establishing, preaching the gospel throughout the then known world and establishing churches and writing the New Testament. The apostle's job was to write the New Testament, and that's what they did. They had the authority by God to implement New Testament commandments. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, if any man seem to be spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. And I think that's the first Bible class I taught in this church when I came almost two years ago, uh, the New Testament commandments. The New Testament commandments were commandments not only by our Lord Jesus Christ, but they were the commandments written by the church. And in the 15th chapter of Acts, it lets you know that the apostles were the ones that had the authority of the church to enact New Testament commandments. That was their job. And so therefore, you can readily see that there are no more apostles today. Even though some call themselves apostles um, because they want to uh, pretty much exalt themselves above everybody else, but an apostle's job was to implement New Testament commandments. And of course, you know that no one has the authority today to do that. Can we say amen? Can we say amen? amen. Unless y'all are those that believe that the Pope can. Uh, the Pope can't even keep the priests celibate. How is he going to enact some New Testament commandments? And the church say amen. And I try and speak with disrespect to the Pope. He speaks a very high, highly educated man. He speaks seven languages of his own right, but he don't know the truth. He's got his own problems uh, with those corrupt priests that he have. Um, but anyway, um, the apostle's job was to write the New Testament. Our New Testament is complete. There's no additions to it. Uh, we have all that God ordained for us to have. And so all of the apostles were personally trained by Jesus Christ. And the apostle Paul lets you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he was the last of the apostles to be called because he said, last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due season. So though we do have some that call themselves apostles and many of them are good men, they just have a misunderstanding on what the Bible teaches. Once the apostles did their job by establishing churches throughout the then known world, and also you should realize that in one of your epistles here in the New Testament, I was just looking at it the other day and don't have it offhand with me right now, but Paul, uh, yes, it's in uh, Philippians chapter four, uh, in verse 22, Paul tells the church in Philippi, uh, saying, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So Caesar uh, was the uh, world ruler at that time, but the gospel had become so prevalent that some of the members of his family were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's just how powerful the gospel message was through those apostles. And so they wrote the New Testament, they established God's church in the earth, and once their job was complete, they died, 
and so that office is closed. Now, a lot of people like to talk about the five-fold ministry. Uh, there is no five-fold ministry because the apostles' job is closed. There are no more apostles. There's no more men being taught by Jesus Christ coming down from heaven and personally teaching them for three and a half years. Can we say amen? Now, I know the late Bishop R.C. Lawson, who was the founder of the organization Churches of Our Lord Jesus Christ, say that when God called him to the ministry, uh, he was in his room and God came into his room in the form of a whirlwind and talked to him out of the whirlwind just like he talked to Job uh, and called him to the ministry. Uh, and of course, he went later on and decided to call himself an apostle. Uh, but to uh, the problem with Bishop Lawson was that uh, he was the head of the organization. He wouldn't make any other bishops. He wouldn't make any other apostles. He was the man and trying to be the one man. And so he would not make any bishops in his organization. He called himself an apostle. Then he called himself the chief apostle. And I don't know how you could be a chief apostle unless you got some other apostles, but he wouldn't make no other apostles and he wouldn't make no other bishops. And so one of his protégés, uh, the late Bishop Smallwood E. Williams, broke off from him and took most of his churches out of his organization and form Bible way churches like the apostolic faith. Uh, and of course, this is how things went on. And of course, he made a whole lot of bishops uh, and called himself a chief apostle and, and all these kinds of things. But uh, you see how men can make a mess when they just want titles? You know, titles is not gonna get us into heaven. If you think that when I get to heaven, Jesus is gonna address me as suffering Bishop Johnson, you are mistaken. <laughs> Say amen. That's not how it's going to be. Fact of the matter is, if you study the book of Acts and the epistles, when the apostles referred to themselves, they referred to themselves as their first name. You know, uh, but today we're so caught up in titles. But anyway, uh, he gave some apostles and some what? Prophets. Now, prophet here is an archaic term. Uh, in the New Testament, it means to preach. When you read in the New Testament, prophecy with a C-Y and prophesy with an S-Y, they both mean to preach. Ministers today think it means to foretell the future, that God is showing them something and have you come down to the altar and God is showing them something about you uh, that's going to happen to you uh, tomorrow when all you have to do is just wait till tomorrow comes. Is that right? But this is what they do because they uh, try to lift themselves up to be something that they're not. And a lot of these things that go on today is just not God. Now, don't blame me. It, it ain't my fault. But I have to tell you, it's just not God. Because the apostles didn't do that. You have, every time church assembles together, people expect to see some great miracle. But in the book of Acts, it covers the first 30 years of the New Testament church. And in 30 years in the New Testament church, in the book of Acts, there was only 13 miraculous happenings that occurred in that 30 years. And people think they're gonna see them every time they come to church every week? That will put us so above, far above the apostles? But see, people, uh, they, they wanna be entertained when they come to church. And this is not the place, because God is not gonna be entertaining anybody in heaven, is that right? And there will be no entertainment in the lake of fire. Who's going to be the star in the lake of fire? Fire and brimstone. They're going to be doing the talking. And I ain't going to be listening because I'm going to be in heaven. How about you? You going to heaven with me? <laughs> All right now. So keep in mind then that prophets are simply preachers. That's all they are. If you want to look up the word, look up the uh, etymological definition of the word prophet here, uh, the Greek word, uh, and you will see that. It speaks of just simply a preacher. And so you have some that like to, again, get caught up in titles, and they call themselves prophet this, prophetess that. They just don't understand the scripture. All it means in the New Testament is preacher. And so then you have, and somewhat, evangelist. Now, we generally think of a female preacher as an evangelist, but an evangelist can be anybody that is taking the gospel to places where no churches are established. That's what a true evangelist is. And you think about all the individuals that are called evangelists. Now, the closest that I have known in 38 years of my lifetime of living of someone that uh, has come close to what an evangelist is, is was Howard Tillman. Because Howard Tillman had his group called Tetrak 
and they traveled all around and established churches uh, throughout the country. And of course, I think he retired from that many years ago. Um, but an evangelist is someone that takes the gospel where Christ has not been preached and established churches. Now, I give a lot of credit to uh, Bishop uh, Butler, who's my bishop in the Dominican Republic. Uh, I was talking to him the other day, and he said he has got to go to Peru to bring in some churches, establish some churches in Peru. Then he said he had to go to, I think, Sicily. And of course, he asked me to go. I said, I'm not going all them places. I'm going uh, to Louisville, hallelujah, and stay there. <laughs> but he is going around trying to establish churches and creating other dioceses and trying to uh, spread the gospel, which is very admirable for him. He's one of the hardest working bishops we have in the PAW. Uh, but uh, that's what an evangelist, a true evangelist is. And when you look in the scripture, I think it's in the 26th chapter of Acts, it talks about Philip, the evangelist, and that he had seven daughters that were preachers. And he went around and preached the gospel and established churches where there were no churches. That is what a true evangelist is. Are you with me tonight? And so, and then he says, and some pastors and teachers. Now, of course, these are teaching pastors or pastors that teach. And God has given these gifts to the church. Now, as I always emphasize, the reason why we say it's not a five-fold ministry, it's only a four, because if you look at verse 11, it says, and he gave some, comma, apostles. What's the punctuation after the word apostle? Semicolon. That means that's one office. And some, comma, prophets, semicolon. The semicolon is used to separate the various branches of ministry. That's two. And some, comma, evangelists. How many is that? Three. And some, comma, pastors and teachers. Where's the semicolon at? It's after teachers. So you have four, pastors and teachers. And the word and, when it is separated by two nouns, pastors and teachers, the word and there means even. So pastors, even teachers. Pastors who teach. So you have four. Now, why did God give these gifts? Let's read verse 12. For the perfecting of what? The saints. For our perfection so that through their ministry, we can be brought under obedience and submission to the word of God and to the will of God. He gave these positions for our perfecting. So therefore we cannot perfect what? Ourselves. We cannot perfect ourselves no more than a kindergartner in kindergarten school can teach themselves nor more so than a first grader can teach themselves and progress to the level to where they can go into the second grade. They had to have somebody do what? Teach them. Now, of course, I gave the example this morning that I still remember when I was in kindergarten. Because I was in kindergarten, my mother and father took me to, to, to kindergarten, and the teacher was just so nice, so sweet, I just could not believe how nice the teacher was. And so, uh, we were in the, the, the room. It was just uh, uh, myself, uh, my parents, and the teacher. And she was just so loving and so sweet. And, and, and I never forgot that. But then when my uh, parents left, the kids were outside during recess banging on the door because they saw me playing with all those toys. And so she opened up that door, and those kids came in there. And then I looked at my teacher and realized that she was the most... She turned into the wicked witch of the East. She was so mean and nasty. I was like, what in the world happened? <laughs> I was completely shocked. Told me to get my so-and-so-self over there. I was like, what happened? I said, so, that's why I'll never forget that woman. Uh, that's a true story. Uh, little did I know that I was uh, at five years old, I had a whole life of experiences waiting on me. Isn't that something? Yeah, but I'll never forget that. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, when we go to school, uh, you go from the kindergarten, you go from the first grade, you got to complete the first grade. Now, you can't jump from first grade straight to 12. Is that right? You have to, it takes time. So spiritual maturity 
just like it was in school when we had to progress and go from one grade to another, go from one level to another, and of course it didn't happen overnight, it took time, then eventually we got to junior high, then high school, but as long as we stayed in school, we could progress, is that right? If we dropped out of school, then we couldn't go to the next grade. Now the late Bishop Hancock said, was said that he had a fourth grade education and God blessed him. At that time, he had the largest church at the PAW uh, before he split and formed uh, the PCAF. But he had a fourth grade education. God did some things for him. However, uh, just as it is in the natural, that's how it is in God. We have to grow and go on to perfection, but you cannot do that by yourself. You can't do that sitting at home. No more so than you can uh, not go to school and progress to the next grade. Well, somebody said, well, pastor, what about homeschooling? Well, homeschooling is good, but it has its pros and its cons. Because if you homeschool your children all the way up to a certain age, they lose that or they are unable to develop interpersonal relationship skills in order as far as dealing with other people and other kids. You just follow what I'm saying? And that's why they say it's very difficult for many millennials to deal with issues because all of their contact is on Facebook and Twittering. And people say all kinds of stuff on Facebook that they would never say to your face. Is that right? <laughs> Maybe that's makes, what it makes it so painful. You know, I see people all the time uh, when somebody cuts them off and they start yelling. And, and of course, uh, I, I don't look at folk. If I cut them off, I just keep looking straight. My wife was always looking at them. Did you see what they did? I said, why are you looking? <laughs> you should have heard what they said. I said, I'm glad I didn't hear what they said. I don't cut people off on purpose, but you know it happens, right? You know, and <laughs> so, but I always say to myself, if they knew what I was before I got saved, they would have hightailed it real quick. But the devil knows that we're saved. He knows we ain't supposed to be doing nothing. Is that right? So the devil knows how saved we are. Can we say amen? He, know, he knows how saved we are. All right, so um, for the perfecting of the saints, for our perfection. Just as in the natural, when we go to school and we complete one grade, we constantly go up and up in grade. We're supposed to constantly be going up and up in grade in God. That's called perfection. Can we say amen? So for the perfect of the saints, let's read. For the work of what? The ministry. For the edifying of what? Body of Christ. So God gave these offices, these gifts, these are gifts that he gave for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up, the encouragement, the inspiration, the strengthening of the body of who? Christ. And what's the body of Christ? That's the what? That's the church. Can we say amen? That's the apostolic church. Is that right? And of course, I heard the preacher on the radio attacking the church today. Greater Bethel Temple. I said, he's on at 2 o'clock. He don't post, come on. The, the man, done, now the man is on two hours. <laughs> I said, Lord, I, said, I know he ain't got no church now because he's on the radio for two hours. Who in the world wants to be on the radio for two hours? And I said, Lord, so we got a good laugh. But anyway, uh, how long are these? Ministry is going to be in force. Verse number 13, let's read. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. That will happen at the rapture. At the rapture. All of these offices are giving to take us to the rapture. To get us ready for the coming of the Lord. Because at that time, we will all come in the unity of the faith. We will all take off these sinful bodies and we'll be clothed with a body just like his and we will be uh, uh, raptured up to meet the Lord. That's how long these offices are to be. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, the tree, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. When the rapture takes place, our knowledge right now is in part. 
Our knowledge is partial, uh, partial. Right now we see through a glass darkly, but when the rapture takes place, we shall know even as we are known, which means that we will know then as God knows us now, to the knowledge of the Son of God. Let's read, unto a what? Perfect what? Man. Now keep in mind, he's talking about the church as a whole, not individuals here, the church as a whole. God is working on his church to become that perfect man. Perfect man, let's read, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of who? He gave these offices to bring us up to the stature of Jesus Christ. And we can't do that by ourselves. Can we say amen? No more so than you can teach yourself 12th grade uh, uh, schooling, education, and then graduate yourself and give yourself a degree. Now, I know that um, preachers are getting online, getting licensed, you know, and um, so they say anybody can get a license. Well, that's true, anybody can get a license, you know, but um, if you get your own license on your own, then you got to anoint yourself. How are you going to anoint yourself? <laughs> Can we say amen? God has to anoint you. Praise the Lord. So, uh, yeah, you can get your own license, but are you legit? Is God validating you? We should want God's validation, not man's. All right? So, this is what he's giving it for. Now, let's read verse, verse 14. That we henceforth, the word, that's an archaic term, henceforth means from this point forward. All right? We be no more, what? Children tossed to and fro and carried about with what? Every wind of doctrine. See, these ministries come to stabilize us. That we just don't uh, be carried away with every new thing that comes along. That's where it's supposed to be. Is that right? Can we say amen? You know, the, you know, it's very unfortunate because a lot of the language that is in the nominal church world, we're adapting some of their language. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, because the church today is uh, taking up vernacular and terms and languages that we never used before. For example, uh, and this is gonna hurt, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get my breakthrough. You supposed to be the breakthrough, not trying to get one. Because you got your breakthrough when you went down in Jesus' name and God filled you with what? What you need another breakthrough for? You need the Holy Ghost all over again? But see, these, this is a, an example of us picking up what the church world is saying. You know, and folk think that they can shout and they shout and say, I got my breakthrough. Well, the devil don't care nothing about a shout. Just as long as you don't repent, you continue to do the same things that you're doing. He don't care nothing about you shouting, just have an attitude about coming to Bible class. That's all he wants. You can shout all, all, all you want. <laughs> I told y'all, I would you didn't I? You know, see, 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 we, we, we have picked up too much stuff from the church world. See, they talking about getting their breakthrough because they don't have the Holy Ghost. They ain't been down in Jesus' name. So, of course, they need a breakthrough. They need to be saved. But why are we using the same terms that they use? See, we got the power. Greater is he that is where? And you the heat is in the world. See, a lot of times it's just about the person just need to make up their mind. They're going to do what God said do. That's the bottom line. Well, y'all quiet on me. That means y'all listening. <laughs> I tried to warn you a little bit. You know, that's the breakthrough. When you're going on, you see, if you in, look at it like this. Can I just talk to you? <laughs> it's like this. When you're when you in school, if you need a breakthrough in class, what is the problem? What's the problem? Why aren't you passing the test? It might be because you're not doing everything that you're supposed to do. 
Because the teacher explains it to you. He gives you the homework. Maybe you're not doing the homework. Maybe you're not studying uh, properly. Maybe you are flunking the quizzes because you're not half coming to class. But the breakthrough comes in your studies, in your school, when you buckle down and do what you're supposed to do. Am I right or wrong? The same thing happens in, in God. When you do what God tells you to do, and you live in holy, and you are being obedient, and you are faithful, and you're doing everything that God tells you to do, you are the breakthrough. You ain't trying to get one. Am I making any sense? See, so we, we, we got to watch this stuff, all right? We got to watch this stuff. Because there in the church world is not on our level. But a lot of times we think that they are on our level. And they are not on our level. Because we are the church of God. We are the kingdom of God that he's coming back for. He's not coming back for them unless they get in the kingdom. Am I making any sense? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, I ain't, I ain't never had to get no breakthrough. I've been saved for 38 years. I ain't never had to get no breakthrough. Preacher got up and preached one time. Sometimes you try to leave God, he pulled you back. I ain't never tried to leave God. So I need God to pull me back. I just need him to just bring me closer as I get closer to him. Draw an eye to God and he will what? That's why a lot of these preachers I can't identify with. Now, I ain't got no problem with T.D. Jakes. I think he's got, a, he's got a dynamic ministry. He's got a good preacher's voice. He's got it going on in his own right. But a lot of stuff he's talking about, I ain't got them issues. He's talking about, you know, I just don't have it. And you shouldn't be having them either if you're walking close to Jesus as you ought to. You know, so <laughs> be the breakthrough. Can we say Amen. You know, if you do, because God has given us everything that we need to be successful with him. And if I am growing as I ought to grow and I am doing what I ought to do, I'm not talking about struggles, you know, because we all have struggles. Is that right? We always going to have struggles, but you don't let the struggles get the best of you because we have the Holy Ghost. And the problem is, is that we really don't see ourselves the way we really should see ourselves. We are the children of God. We have been set free. We are saved and sanctified. On our way to heaven, and we should be enjoying the, enjoying the trip. Is that right? All right. Praise the Lord. Well, um, that's what these ministries are for, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the deceit of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So these offices are given to us to keep us stable. So every new thing that blows through, we won't get carried away with it. That every doctrine that comes through, we will not um, be taken advantage of, we not succumb to it. You see, uh, Jesus likened the teachings to food. Because he told the Pharisees, he said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. And they thought uh, he was talking about because they didn't bring no bread or something. He said, no, I'm talking about what they teach. Because teaching is like food. David said, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. You can't just eat anything. I can. Some things are poisonous and some doctrines and teachings out there are poisonous poisonous to my, me naturally no poisonous to me spiritually and the gifts that God has given is there to prevent us from being poisoned by bad food that's out there that's why I'm very selective who I listen to because I don't want to be poisoned I'm very selective as to who I have come preach here because I don't want you to be poisoned and God get me for it. You know, the only preachers we have here are preachers that have a reputation for holiness. Can we say amen? Because if they're living holy, God's going to give them something to help me. And that's all I want. 
I don't care how big the name is. If they're not holy, then Jesus might say to them in that day in Matthew chapter 7, depart from me. I never knew you, ye worker of iniquity. Well, Lord, we build great big churches. We prophesy to your name. We cast out devils in your name and did many wonderful works. There's a whole lot of preachers out there doing many wonderful works. But God is going to say to them, I don't know who you are. You ain't one of mine. Why? Because you were a worker of iniquity. You wouldn't live holy. And we'll be surprised. We just make sure that you make it. Can we say amen? Because I'm going to make it. Hallelujah. Some folk going to get mad at me along the way, but I'll be smiling saying, I'm going to be with Jesus. All right. I'm getting a little stirred up all by myself. Uh, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Verse 15. But speaking the truth, how? Now, I'm telling you all this in love. <laughs> Let's read. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in some things, all things which is the head, even what? Christ. I want to grow up in Jesus. How about you? Growing up in Jesus. I need to preach that sometime. Growing up in the law. Yes, sir. Now, we look back over our lives. We had some fun times in childhood, didn't we? But now we're grown. When I was a child, I spake as a child. Some folks still talking like children, even though they're grown. Help them, Jesus. But when I became a man, I put away what? Childish things. And that speaks concerning spiritual growth because we ought to have some growth now that we're saved today. Can we say amen? We ought to have uh, graduated. We should be at the level of our years of salvation. All right? Speaking truth and love. Verse 16. For whom the whole body, that's the church, fitly join how? Together and compacted by that which every joint, what? Each one of you is a joint that's in the body. And the church, the success of the church is based upon how well every joint is operating in the church. Every joint supplieth, let's read, according or based upon the effectual working in the measure of every joint or body or part maketh increase of the body and what is the result? Unto the edifying of itself how? In love. One of the saints came to me today and earlier today and told me they said they feel all they, they say that this church is full of love. I said hallelujah. Because every church ain't like that. Can we say amen? I heard of one church where the deacons were fighting in the basement and the pastor was in the pulpit crying. <laughs> True story. <laughs> the kids were fighting. Oh, help us, Jesus. It won't happen here. Can we say amen? I saw a guy sleeping uh, out there in front of the church with all kinds of trash on the porch. And I was talking to my daughter on my earpiece. I said, hold on, somebody's out there in the porch. I said, hey, this is not the Hilton Inn. Get up. And he got up. Now, some of our brothers have a hard time with some of these guys. They like to talk back. They usually don't talk back to me. They just get up and get to moving. <laughs> I guess I use my correction officer voice. Get up in the name of the Lord. Who? <laughs> I said, come to church. Don't sleep in front of the church. Come to church. The Lord bless you now. The Lord bless you real good. All right, y'all not with me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. I know you're with me. Hebrews chapter 6. Yeah. It's all the trash out there on the porch. Lord, help us, Lord. He's helping us, isn't he? I feel my help. I feel my help tonight. Bishop, I don't know how I feel. He's going to get better. Amen. I'm happy to see Gabrielle Pat uh, pressing her way out tonight. It's a blessing. That's spiritual growth. Can we say amen? Praise the Lord. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, 
on, let me see what we're going to start. Well, we'll start at verse, chapter 6, verse 1. Let's read there. We've got about 20 minutes. Let's read. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The word therefore ties you into the previous verse. Wherefore ties you into the following verse. But therefore ties you into the previous verse. But uh, we're going to read these verses first and then we'll go back to the fifth chapter. He is writing to the Hebrew saints. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You can't leave the principles until you first of all, what? Come into them. Just like you can't leave this building until you, what? Come into it. Once you come into this building, then you can leave it. So therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let's read. Let us go on unto what? You have to come into the principles first. Have them. Have them active in your life. Then and only again, then, then and only then can you leave them, progress beyond. You have to complete the first grade before you can progress to the what grade? Second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth. You can't go from the sixth to the twelfth. Now they say Martin Luther King graduated from high school at, uh, graduated from college, I think, at 19. He was gifted. But even he had to go through the progression to some degree. And of course, uh, two of my grandchildren were upped a grade. They were, uh, they skipped a grade because they were at a higher level uh, of the grade that they were in. So, you cannot go on to perfection. You can't go any higher until you take, until you learn the principles. Then he says, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the what? The foundation. These principles are the foundation. There's six of them. We've taught on them before. Not laying again the foundation of, what's the first one? Repentance from dead works and what? Faith toward God, number two. Uh, the doctrine of baptisms, number three. Of laying on of hands, number four. And of resurrection of the dead, number five. And what's the next one? Eternal judgment, number six. You have to have these principles. Now, the first four has to do with one coming into the church to be saved. Because before you come into the church, you have to repent from dead works. Then you have to have faith toward God. Then you have to be baptized in Jesus' name. And laying on of hands has to do with receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The first four is what brings you into the church. The last two, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, are the result as to whether one comes into the church or not. Why do we say that? Because everybody that has died, whether they come into the church or not, will be resurrected. And everybody, whether they came into the church or not, there is an eternal judgment. There is judgment day. And as long as we understand that, therefore we can leave those principles and go to the next grade, which is what? Perfection. Can we say amen? Now, these saints couldn't do that because they had been saved for nine years, but because they let some things slip, when they should have been able to go into perfection, they needed to be taught all over again. Let's look at chapter 5, verse number 12. All right, we have it. Let's read. But when for the time ye ought to be teachers, Ye have need that one do what? Teach you again, which be the what? First principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of what? You need to be taught all over again. I remember our son Daniel was held back a grade and the teacher didn't tell us. Isn't that something? For a teacher to hold your child back, you not even know? I didn't find out till it was too late. I don't know if it was ra racial or what, but that's what they did. <laughs> you got to watch these teachers today, that right? The days is over when you bring them an apple. The teacher get an apple today, there might be a razor blade in it or a bomb in it. <laughs> or the teacher might try to go with you, isn't that something? <laughs> I was going to say, no, I ain't going to say that. But anyway. <laughs> When for the time you ought to be teachers, you have neither. Now they have been saved for nine years. They should have been able to teach somebody something. But see, they didn't grow. They didn't go into perfection. 
They didn't go forward, they went backwards to the point to where they needed to be taught all over again. It's just like a child cannot go to the next grade, they need to, re they need to, to do a redo, because why? Because maybe they didn't do what they were supposed to do. I remember when we graduated from high school, me and Bishop Tim Johnson, we graduated from high school together, Jackson High. And of course, uh, during the commencement ceremony, uh, there was a, a, a man that, uh, a student that walked the stage and he got his diploma and he started jumping around and, and we all was yelling, he made it, he made it, he made it. And of course, um, they were celebrating, me and Bishop Tim was laughing at him because he was 21 and the rest of us was 18. <laughs> he was 21 years old, graduating from high school. He should have been in his third year of college. But Walter was too busy being pretty boy with the girls, see? And uh, then he realized that they're not laughing with me, they are laughing at me. And he went through his life and never accomplished anything. Well, as far as I know, this day, he's almost 60 now, has never accomplished anything. You know why? Because when for the time he should have graduated at 18, he had to redo. Now you, they don't keep you in high school till you're 21 now because the government ain't gonna pay no money for no grown man to finish high school. <laughs> you have to go to, what they have down here? They had alternatives in Michigan. What do they call them down here? Vo vocation? Isn't that a nice term? Vocation. They're trying to be kind to them. There's nothing wrong with you having to go back and get your GED or anything like that, but I was just making a point. He fooled around, and saints sometimes fool around, and these saints fooled around to the point to where they should have progressed and grew, but they were like babes. And I think I used this example before. Uh, think of a nine-year-old child sucking on the bottle. That's not good, is it? Well, I can give you a drastic example than that that you probably won't forget. How about a nine-year-old nursing from their mother's breast? Somebody's going to prison, is that right? <laughs> Unless you're a Catholic priest, Lord help us, Jesus. Yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> but that, you think about that, don't try to picture that, but you think about that's how these saints were. Isn't that terrible? Do you get the picture of how bad that is? That they should have been able to level? Why? They didn't grow. They did not do. The ministry was there to give them growth. God gave the gifts. So it wasn't God's fault. Whose fault was it? That's why we say when you come to church and you don't get nothing, it's your fault. Because God can give you something. The preacher might be up there flunking. <laughs> That's the term we used to use, flunking up there preaching. But if you are looking for something from God, God will give you something. Yeah, I got any witnesses around here? He'll give you something. I ain't going tonight. You know how they do. Well, you're just going to miss your blessing. That's all. You know, I ain't, I ain't going. See, I don't want Raider Johnson saints, I want the Lord saints. Who's Raider Johnson saints? They only come to church when Raider Johnson is there. I ain't nobody. Jesus is the man who's God. Can we say amen? That, that's why I come. So how mature are you spiritually? The bishop ain't gonna be there. I ain't coming. Oh, you got some growing to do, child. Oh, I'm teaching hard. I'm on your toes tonight. My feet are hurting. I'm on your toes, so tough. <laughs> oh, yeah. It speaks of your maturity. How mature are you? You know, the ministry is given to bring you up from that. See, that's what a babe are doing Christ because they don't know better. But if you've been saved any length of time, you know better. Can we say amen? All right. So, um, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles, the oracles of God. That's these six principles. They need to learn those things all over again. 
and are become such as have need of what? Milk and not of what? Now, I love strong meat. I want some steak every now and then. Medium rare. Thank God we're not in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. So, milk is good. I love milk. It don't love me, but I love it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But every now and then, of course, when it comes to the saints of God, the man of God, the woman of God, that God has put in the position of the pastor, the scripture says in the 24th chapter of Matthew, we give meat in what kind of season? Due season. There's a time for us to bring some deep things from the Bible, and there's some times for us to bring some practical things. The pastor, the New Testament pastor, cannot just be giving out meat all the time. Because you're going to choke them. Nor can they just be giving out milk all the time. Because they ain't getting no protein. The protein of the word. I got to like that. Where did come? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, see, God gives you things while you're teaching. Did you know that? He gives me lots of things while I'm teaching. Um, so... Let's read the next verse. We're almost finished. We've got 15 minutes, and then you will be delivered from tonight. Become such as have need of milk, not a strong meat. Verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is what? Unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a what? So these saints have been nine, say nine years, and they were still babes. Now, we're not babes. We know what God can do. Is that right? Can we say Amen. We know some things. We've been through some things. We should not be babes. We should not be unskillful in the word. We should be able to tell somebody about Jesus. We, our lives, our spiritual lives, should reflect some maturity in Christ. Now, I can tell a lot of y'all growing since I've been here. I can tell as the pastor. God gives the pastor insight. And it's not these glasses. He gives us spiritual insight to see the maturity of the saints. And then he also gives us insight to see that some are not maturing as they should. And so he gives us what to teach, gives us what to preach. Because the office of the pastor is a gift to you to bring you to what God wants you to be. And you can't get it by yourself at home. He didn't set it up that way. Can we say Amen. <laughs> well, um, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word righteous, for he is a babe. Let's read verse 14. But strong meat, that's the deep things of the word of God, belong to them that are of what age? Full age. A full age saint is a saint that is mature and they are at the level that they're supposed to be. If you've been saved for five years, you should have five years worth of development. If you've been saved for 10 years, you should have 10 years worth of development. What bothered you 10 years ago should not be bothering you now. You should be past that. And if you're not past that, something's wrong with your growth. Folks should be, and that's why God will let some folk hurt you in the church. Because if it happens, God let it happen. Is that right? Hurt didn't tell God, get out the way, I'm about to hurt the saint. And God's cowering in the corner somewhere looking at you and, and worried about you because hurt came and hurt you. No, that's a, everybody's got to be tried where? In the church. Did you know that? Can we say amen? You say where I'm coming from? You said God brought you here. The devil heard you. <laughs> All of the demons heard you. You know what they say? All right. We're going to see and see, what he going to do? He going to bring this. He going to bring that. You know, and it ain't going to come from the places you think it's going to come from. It's going to come from right from the folk that say, praise the Lord, the Lord love you. Are y'all hearing me? <laughs> now, they talk about church hurt. We need church hurt because church hurt shows you where you stand in God. Y'all done got real quiet thinking about that, aren't you? I've been hurt in church. I've been hurt more in church than out of the church. But I'm still in the church because I'm here to prove the devil that he's a lie. 
Everybody's got to be tested. Everybody. I was tested for years to flee Bay City. <laughs> but I didn't go. Ku Klux Klan, all kinds of clans was going on up there. But I said, God sent me to be, I ain't going nowhere. And you know what? If the pastor gets tested, don't you know you're going to be tested? So you're going to get hurt. Somebody's going to offend you. Somebody's going to hurt your feelings. Somebody's going to do you wrong in the church. Why? Because it is all part of your spiritual development to say, to get you on uh, on the level to say, you know what? I don't care. I'm still going to be with Jesus. I ain't going nowhere. Are y'all hearing me tonight? And when you are at that level, whereas before you wouldn't take that, that means you are growing. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't see where I'm growing as a pastor. Can you imagine me saying that? I did say that. And then all this trouble came to me. <laughs> and the Lord said, see, you're growing. Because look at what you can take. You couldn't take that years ago. But look what you can take. So, see, if you talk to God and ask him certain things, he'll tell you certain things. You hear what I'm saying? And you will know it's God, too. Because uh, God knows you. And uh, because, see, when you have low self-esteem like I do, it's hard to believe, isn't it? I'm not lying to y'all. <laughs> I got low self-esteem. But you would never know it other than me saying it. You know why? Because the Lord helps me. You mean to tell me as much as you say you got low self-esteem? Yeah, I sure do. If you ever know, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> I'm telling you too much already. All right, verse 14. <laughs> well, the child's want me to say it, but I ain't going to say it. <laughs> verse 14. But strong me belong to them that are full age. Let's read. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to what? When you are maturing in Christ, you develop to discern between what is of God and what is not of God. Because the enemy is such an imitator that it can become difficult to decipher between what God is in, what he is not in. And I give you some of those examples in Bible class, like trying to get my breakthrough. You got your breakthrough when you got saved. That was the break. What other bigger breakthrough can there be for God to bring you off drugs and alcohol and all this other kind of stuff and wash your sins away and fill you with the Holy Ghost? There ain't no breakthrough greater than that. No, I just, and I use myself as an example, I just need to repent and make up in my mind that I'm going to do what God says do. That's, if you want to call it a breakthrough, that's the breakthrough, that's the deliverance. You can't pray your way into it. You got to make your mind up. Can we say amen? All right. So when you are growing and mature in Christ, you develop the sense to discern between what God is in and what he is not in, and that becomes greater and greater and greater in you. Why? Because you are getting closer to God as you're learning more about God and God is revealing and sharing things to you as to what he is in and what he is not in, whereas you would not have gotten that if you have not grown. Just like as you grow up in school and took basic math, you never would have understand calculus, algebra and calculus until you first of all had mastered basic math. You see what we're saying? It's the same. God uses the things that he does with us spiritually. There, is, there are examples of it all through it naturally that we have experienced and do experience and will experience. It's the same principle. It's just the difference is God is doing it now. Can we say amen? And 
and that's what we want. All right, well, let's go to Jude. The book of Jude. And we got about seven minutes. Jude. Jude, verse number 21 and 22. Now, verse 20 and 21. Perfection is, pro is a progressive process. It's in one small increments, like one step at a time following one after another. You just keep on walking. If I was to leave here and walk home, God forbid, <laughs> over there at the Hearst barn, if I keep walking, I'm going to get there. It might be tomorrow, but I'm going to get there. Say <laughs> amen. How will I get there? Because I keep, I'm not stopping. I'm keeping on walking one step at a time because I can't run no more. So it's just one step at a time. That's how it is in Jesus. It's one step what? And just like we experienced in school, one grade at a time. All right. So um, let's read. Verse number 20 and 21. Let's read them straight through, then I'm going to break them down for you for the next five minutes. Let's read. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The subject of these two verses is keep yourselves in the love of God. And there are three methods by which you keep yourself in the love of God that he gives us. Number one is in verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. The next one is praying in the Holy Ghost. The third one is in verse 21. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's the rapture. That's what we're looking for. So... We have to keep ourselves where? In the love of who? God. We have to keep ourselves in God's favor. We have to keep ourselves in God's graces. We have to keep ourselves in the love of God. Number one, we do that by building up ourselves on our most holy faith. What is our most holy faith? It's holiness. You build yourself up in holiness you be obedient to god's word adhere to the ministry that god has given you that will enable you to grow and the more you grow the more holy you become the more like jesus you become so our focus then first of all is building up ourselves spiritually and you do that by living holy as the word of God is taught to you as to what you should be doing, as to what you should not be doing, uh, and all these type of things, as we walk with God and increase in knowledge, we are building up ourselves on our most holy faith. We are building ourselves up in holiness. That's how you keep yourself in the love of God. You follow? Then the next one is praying in what? Praying in what? The Holy Ghost. Now he says praying in the Holy Ghost because unless we are praying in the Spirit, God is not hearing our prayers. You see, uh, sometimes our prayers is not getting above our head because we're not praying in the Spirit. That's why he says in Ephesians, uh, praying always with all prayers. No, Philippians. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the what? Spirit. Why do we have to pray in the Spirit? Because we don't know what to pray for as we are. That's why. So when we get down on our knees, we have to get in the Spirit. We ought to be talking to God until we feel the Holy Ghost. And it doesn't have to mean that you have to speak in tongues. See, can I tell y'all this? I told the day Bible class, I got to tell y'all this. When I get down and pray, because see, when you get down and pray, sometimes you have, you have all these thoughts in your mind. Is that right? 
all these battles going on, these thoughts in your mind, what happened today, what happened yesterday, what you got to do when you get done, and all those other kinds of stuff, all the cares of life affect you. When that happens and you're dealing with that, you're not in the spirit yet. But as you continue to go and talk to God, eventually those things fall off because you go into the presence of God. And so the quickest way I do it, when I pray, I just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because when you call that name, something happens. Can we say amen? And that clears my mind out quick. And then I'm in the presence of God. And therefore, when I pray then, my prayers are not selfish because the Holy Ghost is directing me as to what to pray for. And while the Holy Ghost is directing me, it's making intercession for me. It's helping me at the same time. Even though I may not say anything about what I want the Lord to do for me, the Holy Ghost is still working in my behalf while I'm praying for somebody else. Does that make sense? And when I'm doing that, I'm building up myself because I'm praying in the Holy Ghost or I'm praying in Jesus. I'm praying to Jesus and I'm praying in Jesus and he is working in me at the same time. Isn't that something? That is spiritual growth. But if I don't never pray, how can I get there? Now, it's good to pray at home. You should pray at home. But there's something special about corporate prayer. And what is special about corporate prayer is that all of us are coming together as one, talking to God. We need that. Can we say amen? amen. It's the least attended service in any church that I know of. And it's one of the most important things we need to do. Because we, we all are one, talking to Jesus. And that's why I had the ministers pray out loud. I want you to know that prayer is another dimension when you talk to God out loud rather than talking to him in your heart. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with talking to him in your heart. But when you talk to God like you're talking to somebody else, as if he's standing right there, that's something special. And that's what I wanted the ministers, when I first came here, I got some pushback. <laughs> some are still pushing. <laughs> but most, many, some of them are getting it. Because when the more real you treat God, the more real he becomes to you. And so that's why I emphasize See, we don't have a problem praying or preaching out loud. Can we say amen? We don't have no problem. But like Bishop Bonner said, and I agree with him, I love praying more than I love preaching. Because when I'm preaching, I'm talking to you. When I'm praying, I'm talking to Jesus. You see, just like reading the scriptures. Now, it's good to read the scriptures to yourself. But it does something else to you when you read it out loud than it would if you read it to yourself. Because the scripture says the word is nigh thee even in thy what? Mouth. It's something about when you put the word in your mouth and your ears hear it, it's making an impression on you. If you don't believe me, try it sometime at home. Take your Bible, go out somewhere uh, in a secluded place and just read the word out loud and then come back and tell me. Unless you've already know about it. Prayer is the same way. Because sometimes you have to talk to God out loud because the devil is making noise in your mind. Trouble is talking to you in your mind. Heartache is talking real loud. So let me call on the name of the Lord. Like Bishop Clifton Jones said, he just holler. You remember that? He's coming next month. Rejuvenate us. See, Bishop Clifton Jones, he's a different style of teacher than I am. Bishop Clifton Jones has the ministry that uh, his teaching, he comes to churches and sounds the alarm, wakes everybody up. Can we say amen? <laughs> He's the alarm sounder. All right, we almost, we need to quit. So, um, praying in the Holy Ghost, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ eternal life. So, uh, to keep myself in the love of God, I have to be looking for Jesus to come. Because if I am constantly looking for Jesus to come, then I'm going to be getting myself ready for him to come. Can we say amen? Because if I'm never thinking about Jesus coming, then I'm not going to do anything about 
getting ready for him to come. Just like if somebody is supposed to come and pick you up for something, if you never think about it, how are you going to be ready when they get there? So part of keeping myself in the love of God is looking for Jesus to come and get me. And so because it's in my mind, I'm doing something about it. Even if it's just in my mind, because the world ain't thinking about Jesus. The fact of the matter is, most of the church world ain't thinking about Jesus. So the preachers certainly ain't thinking about Jesus because they ain't even talking about Jesus. They don't think that he is important. That's the reason why we in the church in the first place. How are you going to be in the church and not talk about Jesus? What's more important than talk about Jesus? Your breakthrough? <laughs> your season? Your blessings? If you ain't looking for Jesus, there is no blessing outside of Jesus. You say amen? Oh yeah, there ain't no blessings outside of Jesus. He is the blessing. Can we say amen? So, if I'm going to keep myself in the presence of God, which means in the favor of God, in the love of God, I'm going to build up myself in holiness. I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to be looking for Jesus to come and take me out of here. All right. Are there any questions tonight uh, before we close? Yes, Brother Davis? Acts chapter 10, verse 11. Acts 10 and 11. All right, what's your question? Yes, God, you want to know what the vision is dealing with? Well, he in us and, and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have, not eat, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto me, unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. What God was showing Peter, because they thought salvation was only for them for 10 years. And God is showing him, look, what I have cleansed don't call common. I am going to extend salvation throughout the four corners of the earth. Anybody's going to have the opportunity for salvation. And that's why he sent him to Cornelius' household. And when he heard Cornelius' testimony, uh, he realized that God is here to save anybody that will be saved, not just us. That's what the vision meant to him. Because God was doing a new thing, extending salvation to non-Jews. Because the apostles only preached to their own kind. They were only doing what Jesus told them to do. When Jesus sent them out in the 10th chapter of Matthew, he said, don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go to the Gentiles. Only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's what they did. And they did that for eight years until Philip went down to Samaria, preached Christ to them. The Samaritans were saved, which were mixed Jews. And so they said, okay, I'll save them. They're mixed Jews. That's okay. That's fine. But then God gives Peter this vision because he was the man with the keys. He was the presiding bishop of the apostolic church and dealt with him and used him to open the door of salvation to the Gentiles. And that's what that vision implied. Now, what does every single thing in the vision means? We don't know, uh, but that's not the point. The point is why he got the vision, what the vision told him to do and what happened afterwards because not only did Cornelius get saved but his whole household got saved so his whole household represent the Gentiles that would now have the opportunity for salvation and that's what that vision showed him anyone else yes sir
that is possible just like in school. If you are in school uh, and you have a teacher that is not teaching the class properly, then you won't get what you need. When I was in Jackson High in the ninth grade, we had a teacher that came to class drunk. And he was sit behind the desk sleep, and we were going through his desk looking at the, porn the pornographic magazines that he had in his desk. <laughs> I wasn't saved then now, hold on now. I wasn't saved, just, you know. And so what happened is that the, now we didn't stop going to class. Oh, class was fun. We didn't stop going to class. But what happened was that the school officials removed him and put a teacher in there that would do the job. God will do the same thing. Because the ministry is set up to bring us to perfection. And so uh, Bishop Paddock used to say that if you have a pastor that is not doing what he's supposed to do, he used to say, don't leave, stay there and pray. That's what he said, okay? And that's what he taught. Um, I can't say for you to do that because I didn't do it. <laughs> but uh, I think with my situation, it was a little different because my pastor was teaching it was two gods. And then the other pastor was teaching that Jesus was a man that had to be baptized. And I asked him what name to get baptized. He never could tell me. And he had to get the Holy Ghost just like everybody else. So sometimes you have to do what is necessary to save your soul. Now, um, but if you, you stay in the truth though, you stay in the truth, but absolutely that does play a part in it because you have some pastors that have come from better schools than others, been trained differently, been trained better, and so on and so forth. Yes, that does have an impact on the congregation. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you. Yes. You want me to explain it? There. <laughs> There is no gift in the Bible of laying on of hands. You don't need a gift to lay hands on somebody. Is that right? We do it all the time. Praise the Lord, brother, we lay hands on them. But the laying on of hands in Hebrews chapter 6 has to do with receiving the Holy Ghost. Because the apostles had the peculiar gift that whoever they laid hands on, God will fill them with the Holy Ghost. That's why it's called laying on of hands. Now, of course, they weren't given the Holy Ghost to people, but when their faith reached God and they laid hands on them, and sometimes when they laid hands on them, that amplified their faith and their faith reached God and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. That was a gift peculiar to the apostles. In 2 Corinthians 12 and 12, I think it is, Paul says, truly the signs of an apostle was wrought among you. God gave the apostles certain ability to do things because they were apostles. So nobody today has the power to lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Ghost. Nobody does. Now, I have laid hands on folk and they got the Holy Ghost, but I have laid hands on folk, on, on, on folk and ain't nothing happened. No ghost whatsoever came upon. So it's based on their faith. I have laid hands on people and they have gotten healed. I have laid hands on more folk and then nothing happened. So there is no such gift in the Bible as the gift of laying on of hands. One of, in Mark chapter 16, it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Anybody can lay hands on anybody, but you have to be careful though because you can lay hands on some folk and uh, something can happen to you, you know. So, uh, and Jesus didn't even lay hands on everybody, you know. So uh, laying on of hands is not necessarily a necessity, but sometimes we do it uh, as a point of contact and sometimes uh, 
when they ordained, when they ordained those bishops, they laid hands on them. Jo Moses laid hands on Joshua and God told him to do that so that some of your honor will come upon Joshua. What was that honor? The anointing that you had as the pastor will be moved onto Joshua to do the job. But as far as someone specialized in laying on of hands, any believer can lay hands if they have faith in God. All right? Um, then no one else would take our offering. And uh, we're sorry we went a little bit over tonight.